This week on the Green Left News podcast, we're talking Closing the Gap, the far-right riots in Britain and counter-protests, and the latest on the US elections. So welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News podcast. My name is Isaac Nellis, and I'm talking to you from Gadigal land in Sydney. My name's Riley Breen, and I'm coming to you from uh, Wadjuk Noongar land. And we acknowledge that uh, sovereignty was never ceded, and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. The Green Left pledges to stand with First Nations people in campaigns for sovereignty, rights and justice and land back. Um, so we've got a, a good episode coming up. We've got some really interesting discussions. Obviously, uh, what's re- a, a really important discussion around closing the gap and some of the failures uh, of the government in terms of addressing the uh, severe inequality that First Nations people face. We're also going to be discussing these far-right kind of riots um, in uh, Britain and some of the response to that with some uh, anti-racist, anti-fascist protests that have uh, responded. And we've also got a special guest who's going to be joining us for the uh, discussion um, today. Um, and particularly, we're going to be ta- asking him for some insights around the uh, upcoming US elections. So we're joined by Socialist Alliance uh, National Co-Convener and host of the Green Left uh, weekly radio show in in NAR Melbourne, Jacob Andrew Arthur. So welcome, Jacob. Yeah, well, I'm Ray, um, uh, my name is Jake Andrew Arthur and happy to be part of this program. And um, I'm coming here from, you're listening to me here from uh, Rondry Land um, in, in, uh, from the, or the Kulin Nation in NAR Melbourne. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for uh, joining us, Jacob. So to start off, uh, last week, Anthony Albanese told the Gama Festival, which is a, a big First Nations festival up in Arnhem Land, that um, Labor was more determined than ever to close the gap. Um, but that same week, uh, three First Nations people died in custody. So uh, those were a 42-year-old man who died in Western Australia's Hakia prison on August 2nd, and then two in Victoria, 57-year-old who died at Port Phillip prison and a 35 year old at Fulham Correctional Centre and that was both on August 4. Um, So those deaths and a new report, uh, the new Closing the Gap Annual Data Compilation Report which was released in July have confirmed um, what a lot of people already know that not enough is being done um, and that things have actually gotten worse for First Nations people. So particularly around incarceration rates, suicide rates, um, the number of children who are in out of home care and child development, um, the, uh, all of those statistics are getting worse. Um, and I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll read out a few of the, the most kind of shocking statistics that are unfortunately not uh, surprising. Uh, first is that um, First Nations people took their own life at a rate of 30 for every 100,000 people in 2022, which is up from the year before. And it's significantly higher, almost three times higher than suicide rates in the general population. And suicide is also a leading cause of death for First Nations people aged 15 to 39. And uh, it's also the highest uh, rate of death is for First Nations people between 35 to 44. And at the same time, it's the report found that racism is on the rise with the proportion of ex- people experiencing prejudice, uh, well, reporting experiencing prejudice, uh, rising from 43% to 60% uh, over a few year period. So it's pretty clear that, you know, things are getting worse um, for First Nations people and not enough is being done. Um, I wonder if you, either of you had any comments on, you know, what, what kind of uh, promises that Labor's made, particularly since The Voice, where it made these kind of, this big, big proclamation that Labor's going to make this big change for First Nations people. And then since that referendum uh, was failed, basically they haven't really said anything since. Um, yeah, so I mean, back back when the the voice debate was still going on, um, something I remember particularly about the position Lydia Thorpe came out with was that she was very much, and I think this is true of quite a lot of indigenous uh, critical um, progressive no activists. That is, um, you know, many people were actually willing to accept the voice if if the government would at least agree to you know commit to some of the closing, to, to implement the closing of the gap targets. And I, it, 
I think the fact that you know they've Labor's just completely abandoned this um, after they've uh, after they've failed their um, voice campaign is it kind of shows that they probably were never going to actually implement any of these in the first place. None of these are contingent on any kind of constitutional recognition. So these could all have been done, all of these targets could have been done with legislation uh, as it currently exists. Well, yeah, backing down on, you know, something that they went to the election kind of promising um, is this Makarada Commission, Truth and Treaty, and particularly after The Voice, um, they've completely kind of backed down on that. Um, and then recently have, have said they're not going to go ahead with it, despite the Greens putting it forward. Um, I think what's, you know, it's important to note, it's not that like the the gap is widening and Labor doesn't know what to do, like the, the things are spiraling out of control. There's been so many different reports, Royal Commission's recommendations that have been made over decades, including, you know, the, the uh, bringing them home report, which is around ending the stolen generations, uh, Aboriginal deaths, uh, Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, which is in 1991. And there was uh, over 300 recommendations made, and I think only one of those has been implemented in that um, over 30 year time period. And then even re more recent things like refusing to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which um, uh, Senator Lydia Thorpe tried to, to tr tried to put up. Um, so there's all these things that they could be doing, but they're you know basically refusing to do, um, and uh, kind of shows you know that actually making real change and real making things actually better for um for people is not a priority um jacob i wonder if you had any comments on i guess where things could go from here in terms of you know is there any light at the end of the tunnel we've seen a lot of people joining marches particularly around on invasion day every year um so that shows there's a lot of a lot of people who do want change uh, and there was also a few a uh, few uh, NADOC week mar marches a few weeks ago that had quite a good turnout. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have to put, you know, the fact that the Labor Party in some sense is attempting to kind of promise, you know, tokenistic reforms around First Nations rights is very much, I think, reflective of the movement on the ground because, you know, amongst young people, you know, First Nations rights is overwhelmingly a key issue. And in, and in fact, you know, um, in, in this kind of time period, like the past few years, you know, First Nations solidarity is one of those things that, you know, that is con considered very much a key moral issue for a lot of young political kind of people. And I think the fact that, you know, the marches uh, for Invasion Day um, have been massive every year and have continued to grow uh, every year is very much reflective of that kind of growing kind of consciousness. Yet, I think on the other hand, though, it's um, I think it's sort of telling that the Labor Party still, despite the impact of that movement, they're not necessarily willing to give any sort of substantial reforms. And I think one thing that also has to be noted is they're actually going backwards in some areas. Actually, in the key issue of youth justice, uh, the lab we have seen state Labor governments, in a sense, cater to the kind of right-wing hysteria around youth crime. And, of course, all these policies, uh, these hard-on-crime policies, will dis will always, and I mean, the research shows, disproportionately impact on First Nations people. And, in fact, just reporting from, uh, from Victoria, there was a recent announcement where uh, the Victorian government has basically refused, despite promising, to raise the criminal age to 14. And... We also have the other process of um, the so-called treaty process that the Victorian government has um, has um, has has undergone, and of course, there's been no substantial progress on that treaty. And in fact, the the kind of and you kind of get when it comes to that, you kind of get a, a bit of a more of a patronising response from the state government, where they, where I think they'll um, former premier Daniel Andrews basically told the First Nations community, "Well, they have to get back to me on treaty." Uh, which is essentially, you know, basically, um, basically making the argument that the demands that the First Nations community are making of this treaty process are just too much for a state government to uh, to implement. 
Yeah, and I think the the reference to incarceration, particularly youth uh, putting putting children in prisons, basically is is a, is a really important one. Particularly, I think in Queensland, it's been a really intense kind of racist kind of drive to to um, you know build more youth prisons and things like that. And that was one of the statistics that was in the report that was quite. Um, it's one of the statistics that's getting worse is the incarceration rates in general, which has gone up um, pretty significantly. And I think it's like about 10 times higher than uh, the general population is the um, First Nations people. And then uh, First Nations children still make up more than half of the uh, population of, of children, in, uh, of young people in prisons. Um, so, yeah, it's it's those kind of statistics really show really show how bad things have, have gotten. Um, I think the other one is the number of children in out of home care uh, is actually at an all time high. So it's, you know, it kind of confirms that uh, what a lot of First Nations activists and leaders have been saying for, for decades that the stolen generations have never really ended. Um, it's just taken on different forms. So let's move on to our second uh, story for this uh, week, um, where in Britain and the north of Ireland, far-right thugs launched hundreds of attacks um, across the country uh, following uh, lies about the identity of a killer of three young girls at a dance class in July. Um, so basically there was a massive tragedy where there was a stabbing attack um, and three, yeah, three young girls were killed. Um, but basically, in the wake of that, far right media and social media kind of pages uh, weaponized the tragedy and claimed that the killer was uh, a refugee, a Muslim refugee, um, and kind of spurred all this kind of Islamophobic um, hate and racism, um, and which led to these, you know, uh, kind of riots and attacks um, across Britain. In reality, the the killer was was born in Wales and uh, isn't even uh, Muslim, so it's, it kind of shows it's all completely made up. But but even if it was the case, um, it wouldn't be any excuse to you know uh, attack you know other people or um, target you know refugees and asylum seekers. Um, yeah, just jumping in there, um, Isaac. Like that's something that's kind of bothered me a lot about the mainstream reporting on this is that it's almost been framed as though this would be perfectly justifiable if if the claims are true like they focus there's been a lot of focus on the on the misinformation aspect of it and a lot less critical analysis of the fact that there's a, a layer of this right wing just waiting to explode on any given incident i mean if this if it had been true <laughs> then we would be facing the exact same problem right yeah, yeah, and you know, maybe even more of the kind of uh, centre right groups would have jumped in on it as well if if they, you know, if there wasn't this kind of fact that it was all based on a lie in the first place, uh, which is pretty scary. Um, but it, yeah, to give some detail on what actually happened, a lot of um, local mosques were attacked, but not just mosques. There's also attacks on, you know, pubs, cafes, libraries, and even a. Um, a hotel that was being used to shelter asylum seekers was uh, a, there was an attempt to burn it down which is pretty terrifying um so there's all these kind of pretty scary attacks and i mean what just seeing kind of the news stories and the photos come in it was like oh my god what's going on like over there um i guess to put it in the context uh obviously we reported on the british election uh, a few weeks ago on the podcast um where you know there was a Labour victory, but the far right Reform Party got um, a significant kind of number of votes, which is led led by kind of uh, uh, Nigel Farage and is pushing kind of anti um, anti migrant um, policies, basically. Um, so you know that's kind of some of the context showing that there is this kind of bubbling uh, racism and um, anti migrant and Islamophobic kind of stuff going on within British politics and uh, British culture. Um, just to note from our report from uh, our Green Left report on this from a British correspondent, Derek Wall, that the riots weren't really organised uh, centrally by, you know, reform or any other kind of far right group. They were largely kind of decentralised and chaotic, um, just re 
various different random people kind of taking an initiative to organize these racist attacks. Um, but they kind of represent this manifestation of the racism and hate that reform and other far right groups have been pushing. Um, I think particularly follows the kind of normalization of far right ideas that we've seen in Australia as well by, you know, conservative and labor party, um, who are, you know, jumping onto those far right fear mongering about, uh, refugees and borders and things like that to further their own agendas. Um, yeah, so, so basically, uh, what happened in response was the, the new Keir Starmer Labor government responded with a police crackdown and there was at least uh, more than 700 rioters have been arrested so far. Um, that was when I last checked. Um, so there could be even more at this point. Um, but where the kind of the, the light on this, this pretty dark story is that there was um, some huge demonstrations for uh, countering these far right attacks and kind of standing up against racism and Islamophobia that are held all across Britain. Um, so in a lot of most places, the far right groups were completely outnumbered by thousands of anti-racist protesters. So it shows that there's obviously this dark kind of side of things bubbling over in, in Britain and in Western countries generally, but there is a lot of people who are willing to, to stand up and oppose those hateful ideas and, and get out on the streets and stand up for, you know, what's right and show solidarity with the people who are being targeted. I, I, I do wonder um, how much the, how much the, this kind of um, demonstration, Catholic demonstration, how much the forces of that kind of coincide with the ongoing Palestine solidarity movement. How much of the um, the the anti-racist counter demonstrations have been able to draw on existing activist networks through that, and on the other side of that, how much um, overlap there is between this British far right and the kind of Zionist uh, networks? Because obviously, I mean, you know, not all Palestinians are Muslim, but a lot of them are. So there is kind of um, there's kind of a parallel. Uh, conflict playing out there uh, i'd be curious to know how much that feeds into what's happening well yeah i think adding to to this kind of discussion about the palestine solidarity uh campaign and how you know the counter protests intersect with this i mean one thing that has to kind of be put into context is you know there, there's been palestine protests that have been happening weekly in in within britain and yet the kind of corporate sort of media has and the politicians themselves have been attempting to kind of label those um, the marches as hate marches and as anti-Semitic. And one thing that also has to be sort of said about the Keir Starmer kind of political response, where they're trying to create this sort of narrative that we need to put our trust in in the police, in in the state of kind of authorities, uh, yet they're kind of refusing to actually. Um, name the elephant in the room when it comes to these far right protests, which is these far right, the far right have been overwhelmingly driven by Islamophobia. And uh, there's almost sort of like a refusal to even in within the corporate media within within Britain and from the mainstream politicians to actually say, yeah, these far right protests are Islamophobic and Islamophobia has no place in our society. Instead, they're trying to move the they're trying to move the goalposts and then try to say yeah this is just disorder um but actually not but of course there's a reason why they're not saying that it's islamophobic is because if they were to if labor politicians especially the right-wing ones were to say it they would in sense be complicit they would be admitting <laughs> uh that they are in a sense just as responsible for this growth of the of the of these of support for these far right ideas because they have in a sense they've been pushing islamophobia through their support for the genocide in gaza they've been supporting it through their abhor um through catering to the right and um, pandering to the right on immigration and so i think there's there's a there's a lot um there's a lot of um there's a lot that's that's one of the um key contexts by which um this is kind of operating yeah, and just on the the media stuff, I even saw that a lot of the the far right uh, Islamophobic rallies and and riots were, you know, in the media they were called you know pro Britain, 
protests. <laughs> it's like, um, whereas, you know, if, and then they're labeling Palest uh, pro Palestine actions as, as hate marches and things like that. So it's pretty, you can see in the media reporting, you know, where things lie. Um, so I guess uh, another factor, I guess, that you kind of touched on there, Jacob, is um, the pushing of the kind of police response where, you know, let's arrest all these um, people. Um, I, th I think we've got to, just got to be careful because you can easily see how, uh, um, you know, the, the Labour could, could turn that around and say, now we're going to start arresting these kind of hate marches for Palestine and start um, cracking down on, on that, which we've seen, obviously, in Australia, as we talked about last week on the podcast um, with Chloe, we talked about the crackdown on protests in, in Melbourne. Um, and I know recently the police have rejected the, uh, well, health, try, they're trying to stop people in Perth, uh, Borloo, Perth, from marching as well. Um, so, you know, that there's that, you know, you can't just rely on um, the, the state to, to uh, stop these far-right rallies. That's why it was really good to see those big protests happening um, that were organised by various anti-racism uh, groups in Britain. Um, I think, yeah, let's, let's move on to our final uh, story for this week. Um, so many of you will have been closely following US politics ahead of the uh, upcoming 2024 election in November. Um, and we've got, uh, we inv invited Jacob on because he's been following it quite closely and he's been involved recently in a, uh, an interview with um, a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, but I guess to, to give people some context on what's uh, been happening uh, in the last few months. Uh, so there was a pretty disastrous debate between the initial Democrat candidate, uh, Joe Biden, who's obviously the current president, and Donald Trump, where, you know, and there's been all these gaffes and errors where Joe Biden, one, one example was he called uh, Ukrainian President Vol Volodymyr Zelensky, President Putin. Um, and there's all these other things that all kind of spiral together into people kind of questioning whether Biden was the, the right uh, candidate for the job um, to go up against Donald Trump. So um, he uh, has actually stepped down under huge pressure from the uh, parts of the Democratic Democratic establishment. And then around that same time, uh, former President Donald Trump, who's obviously running again for the Republican ticket, narrowly avoided uh, an assassination attempt, um, which many saw as this kind of huge boost to his campaign. So there was a lot of like fears that, you know, that was giving him the a big propaganda boost. Um, however, after Biden stepped down, the current Vice President Kamala Harris has kind of stepped in to replace him as the new presidential candidate and from from afar it kind of seems like it's given the democrats a bit of the momentum back um it's also worth noting that the vice presidential candidates for uh well donald trump has picked ohio senator and actually an author of uh, a hillbilly elegy which was a best-selling book in a and turned into a movie as well jd vance as the vice president who's actually recently called people without children sociopaths um and has all this kind of weird stuff around uh, people without children not having a vote. And then Harris has picked uh, Tim Waltz, who's a Minnesota governor. Um, so I guess we wanted to ask, bring you on, Jacob, to ask um, how do you kind of see the uh, political situation currently? I mean, I how I would kind of view the situation in the United States is, I mean... I mean, the main context by which we have to look at these US elections is the fact that the United States is, in a sense, it represents one of the, the premier kind of imperialist countries uh, in, in the world. It very much represents uh, a country that is committed to a kind of, um, to, to, um, to committed to a hegemony of the global capitalist system. And in, in fact, uh, you know, the United States is kind of seen as like by corporations, by multinationals, as one of the most stable countries that you can invest your wealth in. And I think the the elections and also we also have to deal with the fact that the United States as well is also uh, it's also a country that kind of culturally dominates us as well. Um, like for the fact that you know, the framework by which we even look at things like from, you know, function, from the dominance of Hollywood, 
uh, it is it is all kind of framed within a sort of a, a kind of united within within that sort of within that sort of hegemonic kind of framework. Um, so I think yeah, the the united the, the the kind of political situation I think is very much you know it's very much I would kind of say that the uh, the current political situation, the US election is almost in a sense it comes off as more theatre than something that working class people have any stake in. Because in a sense, you have two parties uh, that are competing um, for votes and both of these par- both parties are support are in a sense capitalist parties. They're all backed by big business. And in fact, the main driving force of all these elections is in fact the massive amounts of donations from corporations that are going to the um to these parties. And I think probably since I, I think with the background you kind of set there, Isaac, I mean, yeah, it was looking quite it was looking quite likely that Donald Trump would possibly win um presidency. But I think based on the recent polls, and it's clear that the Democrats are probably likely um likely to win. Um and I think probably a few things that are happening there is, you know, it doesn't reflect any kind of endorsement necessarily of the Democrats and their political program for working people, but it actually kind of possibly re- it reflects the fact that, you know, within the United States, uh, Donald Trump is actually not necessarily a, pop- a, a popular candidate. In fact, one of the disastrous things about the United States system, even compared to like Australia, um, is that it actually is a? It's probably one of the most undemocratic electoral systems in the world, and in fact, the election is ultimately going to be decided by five battleground states. And there's a lot of different, um, and a lot of other states. They're essentially one party kind of dictatorships. So there's like safe democratic um, democrat states where the Republicans have no chance of winning, and then there's safe Republican states where the Democrats have no chance of winning. So I think. And the fact that they've managed to turn things around, because I think one thing we can't forget about is Biden was also incredibly unpopular. Uh, he was facing fa- falling approval ratings. And I think the Democrats, you know, the cl- it's a classic case of how liberal capitalism manages to kind of reinvent itself. They've essentially given us a cosmetic change with Kamala Harris, uh, but there's actually no real shift in actual policy. Uh, Israel is still... Um, bombing Gaza with the support of the United States. In fact, there was actually a recent report that Anthony Bilkin is has just approved another twenty million dollars in military aid uh, um, to Israel. So there's uh, there's no shift other than the fact that Kamala Harris is probably giving more, more of a bit of rhetorical shift where she kind of feigns a bit more kind of concern uh, for Palestinians, uh, whereas you know Biden was almost in a sense he was completely almost. Yeah, he was in a sense completely unashamedly pro-Israel and not ashamed about it. Yeah, I think you're you're definitely right. I mean, the it's it's political theatre, uh, and the US elections always have been to some extent just this political theatre. Um, I was wondering if you you brought up uh, Palestine and uh, the lack of difference that um, the lack of difference in actual policy between uh, Biden and Kamala Harris on that. Um, what impacts do you think generally that uh, the genocide in Gaza is having on US politics? I mean, I think it's it's I think it's undeniably having a, ma- a, a major impact because I think a few things have to be put in kind of context, which is, I mean, Donald Trump got a, first elected in 2016, um, and that was off, off the back of two... Democratic, um, two Democratic term, terms under Obama. And Obama was also, I think, we also have to put things in context as well. Obama was also elected on the bait on a on a on off the back of potentially being a transformative president, because you know, you, people within the United States had to deal with years of Republican rule um under George W. Bush. And of course, George W. Bush implemented uh, a lot of the kind of terror, like he implemented the war on, on Iraq. Um, and peop- and so many. And in fact, the Iraq, the a movement against the Iraq War, was a mass movement uh, that very much shaped a lot of people's understanding of the role of imperialism and and what does the United States actually do in ter- in in terms of its foreign affairs. So I think that was a big that that's a big thing. But of course, people lived through eight years of Obama, and 
under Obama, there were still drone strikes. Um, there were still innocent uh, children being killed um, by drone strikes in the Middle East. More um, drone strikes, in fact. Yes. Yeah, and the Gaza, what's happening with the Gaza genocide is it's very much, I think it's very much shown to a much larger group of people within the United States that there's actually no meaningful difference between the Republicans and the Democrats when it comes to foreign policy. And in fact, you know, whoever wins the election, people in Pal the Palestinians are still going to be massacred. And I think that's that's the kind of, and I think that's setting a certain context for, but of course this intersects with the general economic crisis of capitalism. That generally intersects with the disenfranchisement that people have with the with both major parties of capital within the United States. So I think there's that's I think that's very much the the kind of impact that Gaza's genocide um side is happening. It's very much opening um it's opening up this whole question about the legitimacy of the United States as a nation itself. And I think those encampments very much put that message out there. And in fact the fact that all the Western countries are uh, have not um uh have not only doubled down on their support for Israel despite how horror despite the horrors that we've experienced despite the no matter how far Israel goes you know the West is still doubling down on its support I think is exposing the the real kind of face of Western liberal capitalism to a much larger section of the work of working people than 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 we've ever experienced in in our lifetime. Yeah, hundred percent. I think it's really, you know, expose the kind of, you know, the the horrors and the 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 destruction of of imperialist imperialism and the United States foreign policy and how it kind of impacts all of us and particularly uh, in Australia with the AUKUS alliance with um, the US and the UK shows we're getting more and more wrapped up in in that. Um, I just wanted to ask about. Uh, I guess the workers' struggles in the U.S. and how it's kind of playing out in context with the um, both both the Gaza genocide and the upcoming election. So I know there's been kind of some big wins in the union movement uh, in the U.S. recently, and I know the United Auto Workers Union has been one of the um, unions that has been leading calls for a ceasefire from from the union movement in the U.S. But they've also just uh, endorsed. Kamala Harris, um, and if you look at the Twitter page for UAW, they're um, putting up a lot of stuff about why, how important it is to get behind the Democrats. So I just wondered if you had any comments around that. And also, um, for people who have been following a little bit, they might have heard about this uncommitted movement, which was, uh, you know, trying to put pressure on the Democrats to um, to push for a ceasefire and push for um, to end support for Israel um, by. You know, voting, saying they're uncommitted voters. Um, so I just wondered if you had any comments on that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to the kind of state of workers' struggle within the United States, um, it is probably there's both kind of exciting, um, exciting developments, like especially internationally. In fact, some you know some of the biggest sort of um, recent sort of strike waves and unionization actually has come happened in the United States, and it has happened in the context of you know, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the general kind of crisis of US capitalism, uh, because, you know, you, you're not, ever, the the thing about the United States is um, it's supposed to be this rich global North country, yet for a lot of working people, it, you're almost living in global South conditions, especially with the fact that you don't have access, there's no universal health care in the United States. Um, wages can be incredibly low for casualized sort of work like the fact in within within an industry like hospitality like hospitality is relatively low paid in australia but in in hospitality in the united states there's a whole culture of tipping because the wages are so uh are so low um so i think there there is a certain but also i guess the other thing as well is there's the challenges of the democrats themselves the fact is the democrats exist not to support workers' struggles, but to co-op them. And so in the case, you know, similar to how the Labor Party in Australia co-ops the, um, the trade union movement here, the Democrat probably plays an even more insidious role because in a sense, the Democrats don't even don't even have a history of coming out of a workers of a workers' movement. And so yeah, in a sense, 
you know a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of worker a lot of un- trade union leaderships every sort of election period get behind this idea that we just need they just need to uncritically sort of back the democrats and probably one of the other challenges that does exist and I, and i think we don't we don't necessarily want to downplay the threats that a second trump presidency will be to build, will be to workers because you know one of the one of the uneven thing one of the things that is that is a big feature of US politics in the United States is the real general unevenness of of legislation and workers laws within within the United States so all the republican states red states will have some form of right to work laws which severely uh limit uh union organization um and of course the democrat states will generally have friendlier sort of um um friendlier sort of work, um work laws. So of course it's very easy for a lot of trade union conscious people uh to be to orientate uh, to the um to towards the democrats because you know if you have a choice between two sort of parties uh the democrats see, clearly seem like the obvious sort of option. Um but I I think you know but at the same time I I think we can't we can't, we also can't ignore the fact that democrats really much don't exist to actually advance workers rights beyond what they're willing what beyond what um beyond little beyond limited concessions and in fact the last time we had a very transformative democratic government which was the whole uh um, new deal um in the 19th post world war ii period that was in the context of a mass <laughs> mass workers movement and the existence of a of a mass communist mo- a socialist movement Many people are going to be discouraged that what will be one of the most important elections is between basically a far-right con man who wants to deport millions of people and strip millions more of their hard-won rights and someone who's actively supporting a genocide for the past 10 months. Is there actually, you know, is there is there actually any left alternative that people can, can uh, swing their energy towards? And um, what are socialists on the ground doing to build anti-capitalist movements in, in what is the heart of the imperialist empire? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, I mean, one, probably this is always um, every sort of election period, um, this, the kind of biggest, the biggest challenge for the socialist movement is that, you know, the majority of well-meaning left-wing conscious sort of voters will generally get sucked into the sort of argument of of lesser evilism, of the need to do it, basically just vote for the Democrats um, as because they're the only kind of um, alternative. Um, but I think, you know, there is actually a lot of hope and a lot of, um, you know, social. There are socialists active on on the ground, um, you know, building independent sort of organisations. We saw it um, in terms of the emergence of the Gaza Solidarity kind of encampments, but we've also seen it in at an even a kind of very local, localised sort of level. Um, you know, we've seen like the efforts of um, of uh, of community campaigners um, fighting against inappropriate development fighting against uh state government sort of legislation we've seen the efforts of like socialist councillors like kawisha sawant in uh in uh in seattle who has managed to push uh use the position to mobilize on a on an extra parliamentary basis but i think yeah the, the kind of key question the key issue for socialists is actually building independent sort of organization that's independent from both the democrats and the republicans because one of probably the, the thing with the that exists the context that exists with the democrats is the democrats are very much linked with you know all the kind of ngos the the kind of liberal sort of capitalist sort of organizations that will sort of exist to sort of constrain any sort of independent political movement that sort of emerges but i think there is i mean right now i mean when you look at the past 12 years of of politics in the united states you know we saw the massive we saw the massive the emergence of the black lives matter movement uh we saw the 15 now uh campaign um you know all that all that happened under under the under the under the under an Obama administration, and then we also had, and then we've also we also saw the emergence of big workers' strikes in red states, um, where, where like the big um, teachers' strike that happened in earlier in the early zero in the zero 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 zeros, and I think you know there's we we there's always going to be I think you know the kind of lesson that's kind of being shown is that you know the the kind of degrade 
denigration of capitalism is going to um, create the avenues for resistance. But I think in the United States, it's always going to be a much harder path. And, you know, it, you one of the one of the big challenges is you with, there's not even a political space to even put uh, a left electoral kind of alternative um, because under the kind of current kind of electoral system, yeah, I think people, I think, there are going to be people who will be voting for the Greens. There'll be people who will be voting for the Party for Liberation Socialism, but they'll kind of never receive a kind of vote that will be significant enough for a, a, a certain layer outside or already kind of committed radical layer uh, to take um, to take them seriously. And I think that's that's one of the kind of challenges. And so, really, the focus has been, you know, for you know, from the interviews that we've done with some of the DSA activists, but also others on the left, because there's lots of debates within the American left. Uh, in the building of independent organisation has been one of the key one been the key things that socialists have been doing to kind of lay the groundwork for building some kind of an independent workers' party from from the Democrats. Um, but also, I think the other the other problem, um, the other challenge as well that exists is politics in the United States is incredibly polarised, um, and in fact, you know we don't we don't know kind of what it's like to kind of. You know the nature of the United States is you can lit you can on one hand you can live in a nice sort of liberal state like California, but on the other hand you could you could be live a, live further south from there in another state where like Georgia for example where you have Republican senators trying to push back rights on abortion to the to the sense the Stone Age so. Those sort of unevenness, um, the kind of unevenness of that kind of exists between the different states in terms of legislation and actual democratic rights, uh, I think cannot, it's not, it's not tenable. Um, and when you see the outbreak of gun violence and violent sort of far right sort of militias, you know, that is a situation where we're going to need your, um, that's going to be a situation that calls for a need for independent left organization. Because if there's if the crisis gets any worse, yeah, it, the Democrats and the institutions of the state aren't going to be the ones to save working people from growing authoritarianism. Well, thanks so much, Jacob, for your insights. I mean, it, it, I'm. It's always hard. It's hard enough uh, being on the left here in Australia, but it sounds like in the US it would be a, a massive uphill battle to get anything done. Um, but yeah, we'll keep watching. Um, this kind of space is particularly when the elections get a bit closer um, but yeah thank you for joining us this week um, I'd just like to say uh, as we wrap up that Jacob's also running in the upcoming local council elections in uh, Melbourne in the Marybeck ward um, so how can people kind of uh, get in touch if they want to help out with the campaign Jacob well, yeah, if they want to, they want to get in touch. They can go onto the Socialist Alliance website at www.socialist-alliance.org and look under council uh, under the elections tab, and you can find a link to our Marybeck Council campaign. Um, and you can also go even follow us on Socialist Alliance Vic, where we are posting a lot of our uh, election material on Instagram. Awesome. And uh, Jacob's running alongside uh, long-standing Marybeck councillor Sue Bolton, who's going for her fourth term as a socialist councillor. Um, I'd also just like to plug, we've got a, a great forum that Green Left is co-hosting with Socialist Alliance uh, that's taking place in Melbourne. Uh, it's on the Bangladesh What's Behind the Uprising. So that's on August 20, so Tuesday next week at 6.30pm at the Resistance Bookshop and Activist Centre. Um, and you can find more information about that on the uh, Green Left website as well. And it's also available for people to join online via Zoom if they're not in Melbourne. Um, and obviously, as we say at the end of each episode, make sure you're getting to any Palestine solidarity actions in your city, whether it's weekly rallies or, you know, whatever else is happening. And you can check the Green Left calendar, greenleft.org.au slash events to find um, out um, any of those events. <laughs> So particularly in um in Blue Perth this week, this is the this is the most the police have tried to crack down on uh, our solidarity protests. So it's more important than usual, I think. So if there's anyone listening that's from Perth, uh, get down this weekend if you if you're able to, because we, we really need um a solid showing so that our right to march isn't restricted. 
Yeah, 100%. Any Perth people, make sure you get to the rally this weekend. Uh, I'd also like to thank Sean Valenzuela for the music you heard on this podcast or at Little Archer Beats. And if you liked this episode or um, and you want to find out how to become how to help us keep it going, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au slash support. And it goes a long way to helping keep you know activist media alive. And um, obviously, we don't take any corporate donations or sponsorships or anything like that. So we rely on you know the support of uh, you know everyday people who watch and listen and read uh, Green Left. Um, We've got a bit of a special way to end the podcast this week. We're going to play a track from the newly released album Take the Rad Pill by regular Green Left contributor Matt Ward. So Matt has been compiling uh, monthly album uh, recommendations and kind of linking them in with the recent uh, political news and things that have been going on um, for years for Green Left. Um, And he's also been making music. He's released nine albums since 2017. So this track that we're going to play is called Your Vote's a Joke and you can stream or download the album uh, for free at the link that I'm going to put in the podcast description and we've also got a great interview with Matt um, on the Green Left website so make sure you check that out. Um, But yeah, this is uh, uh, the end of the episode so thanks for listening um, to the Green Left News podcast and we'll see you next week. Bye. Joke. If it changed anything, they'd find it out right tonight.